Thanks for joining us for Process Palooza today. I'm Tracy Arur, co-founder of the Just In Time Cafe. I'm also an instructor for the Lean Six Sigma Green Belt and Lean Six Sigma Leadership Courses at UC San Diego Extension. And I am honored and excited to be your moderator for today's Palooza. Today, we're going to be hearing inspiring continuous improvement stories from nonprofits and community organizations, as well as our featured interview with UC San Diego's Chief Information Officer, Dr. Vince Kellen. We'll close out the session with the results of our process improvement competition, the great Lean Six Sigma race. I cannot wait to hear who the winner is. And this session is going to be recorded and placed on the Process Palooza website. Megan has inserted that in the chat. So this webinar has live closed captioning. You can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen and select show subtitles. Instructions are also posted in the chat right now as well. And don't forget, please feel free to use the Q&A window to submit any questions at any time for our panelists and our presenters. So the theme of today's Palooza is process improvement inspiration with community service. So most people know that continuous improvement is often associated with private industry, but guess what? Process improvement is also thriving at nonprofits and community-based organizations as well. So last week, we heard from the nonprofit Life Sharing and how they're applying process improvement with the organ donation process. Today, we are here to introduce our Kittens for Good and our Kitchens for Good panel, two of my favorite nonprofits in San Diego. And that would be the San Diego Humane Society and Kitchens for Good. These are two incredible nonprofit organizations with very inspirational missions, and they're creating cultures of continuous improvement. So we're going to bring on our San Diego-based nonprofit Kitchens for Good first. They have a wonderful purpose and a nonprofit mission and are known as a second chance organization or nonprofit. Their primary focus is a culinary school for struggling community members that have been incarcerated or in rehab. The culinary school and apprenticeship program teaches students what they call knife to life skills. So after the culinary program, the graduates are placed into meaningful careers with some of the Kitchens for Good local partners like hotels and restaurants, helping individuals escape a life of poverty and create a path for a better future. So Kitchens for Good also helps fight hunger relief in our community. They cook and package 800 to 1600 meals a day and they work with their network to get these meals distributed without throughout our community. So I love this organization and I donated my process improvement consulting services in kind and also recruited the help of Sally Toyster, Mark Myers and Mike Osterling to help work with Kitchens for Goods team, team members to improve processes and operations. So we got to work with people from Kitchens for Good, employees like Lori Love, Mary Scafidi, and two other people on our panel today, Ryan and Karen. So please welcome Ryan Rizzuto, Kitchens for Good production chef, and Karen Markham, the production lead cook. How are you guys doing today? Super fabulous. Great, thank you. Thanks for having us on, Tracy. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy day and your very inspiring mission to share what you guys are doing at Kitchens for Good. So first of all, I love your organization. You're doing so many great things. And I know, Ryan, when I first started helping Kitchens for Good, you came in after I had started helping with process improvement, but I'd love to hear how you were first exposed to process improvement at Kitchens for Good. Did you want to share that? Of course. Um, it was a little bit of a whirlwind. Um, I was hired on uh, just a week before the pandemic started um, to lead the catering operations here. Um, within a week, though, all of our catering operations vanished and um, we quickly pivoted into what we thought was going to be a short term um, production of hunger relief meals for our uh, fellow San Diegans 
that were uh, hungry. So um, when Tracy stepped in, uh, I presented her with the um, big challenge on my part of how do I produce and package at the time 2,500 meals a day. <laughs> <laughs> yep, he was like, so can you help me with this? <laughs> So you got your your yellow belt, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, Tracy uh, helped me out with uh, gaining the yellow belt along with uh, a few of my other coworkers, um, and this was just a great way to wrap our heads around the problem at hand and how to attack it um, with solutions. Yes. So, so Karen, I wanted to ask you too. You were one of the first people that I got to work with at Kitchens for Good. And basically I followed you around <laughs> to see what you were doing, what your processes were and what some of your daily challenges were. What was your experience like with process improvement? What was it like for you to, to have me follow you around? <laughs> Well, I, I knew that we needed to change a lot of things that were going on because there were a lot of repeat steps. And I think I always had it in me to implement these things, but having you there in support of some of the ideas that I had, and you were able to help me present to present it and how to really um, make it work. And yeah. I was so happy and it was such a blessing to have you step into our organization because you really made a huge change and we're still seeing those changes today. Oh, thank you so much, Karen. Well, I remember walking around, following you around. You are a hard worker. Ryan is too, of course. But I saw your job firsthand. I'm like, wow, how do I make this easier for you? How do I make your job easier for you? And a lot of it was you were dealing with volunteers that were coming in every day, every night. And it was very, a very, what I noticed right away was it was, it was a very repeatable process, but some of the things you were doing from scratch every, every evening, and we were looking to really try to streamline that part of it for you. Yes. So what do you think was some of the most applicable concepts um, that were, that worked at Kitchens for Good, that were in process improvement, Brian or Karen, which one would you like to share? Well, right now, I think the procedure that we have a, a definite a definite process and where people come into our facility now, everything is you do this, 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 and this, and it never changes. Uh -huh. And when you have something in place, it gives you structure, it gives you, there's no guesswork. And I think that is huge right there. Uh -huh. And to expand on that too, we, we um, the, the largest kind of um, issue we were running into was our packaging. We were able to produce the food, but when it came down to it, how do we individually package up um, a three comp compartment meal um, by the thousands? And so we, we identified some issues in the, the packaging line. And um, as I was explaining to Tracy, we had this very large um, we call it the Willy Wonka gobstopper <laughs> machine. It had so many parts and pieces and one little thing was off and, and the whole thing wouldn't work, which would stop our process. So we removed that and we added in just simple takeout containers with lids. And we've, been, we've really been able to scale up our production um, to almost 300,000 meals in the last year. Wow. I love that. No, yeah, it was really interesting working with the volunteers and really looking at flow and how it was set up in terms of workload balancing. And I remember, Karen, um, with you, we were doing some 5S in the workplace, in the kitchen, right? Yes. Organizing things. I remember you had your own secret stash of ladles. Yes, I had to, I had to, I had to. Because you didn't want them to disappear, right? Right. If you have the right size label for the portion, it's much easier than uh, guessing or having to wait every single um, serving. So Yes. And now you're in a new space. You have a new huge kitchen um, yes. at the Door of Hope. So tell us a little bit about that. That was an interesting um, move because uh, in the midst of pandemic you know, response and, and cooking high volume for uh, the last year, we also moved our operations from the Jacob Center now to the Door of Hope at Salvation Army. So uh, Tracy actually had the opportunity to view this space prior to us moving in because we were trying to wrap our heads around 
how do we have a teaching facility mixed with large scale operations of production going at the same time side by side. And it was a shell of a space when uh, Tracy visited it uh, back last year. And so when we did uh, re renovate and everything, we brought in all of our items. And at that point, we really 5S the kitchen to be exactly what we wanted, which was an advantage of being able to move into a new space as we could set it exactly how we wanted to. And there was a lot of moving things around when we saw uh, people in the space using it. We then adapted as we as we went along. So that is very exciting. I haven't, because of COVID, I haven't been able to get into that place since you guys opened your doors and you got all set up. So I can't wait to see it. So Karen, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit and share, have you share your story. As I got to know you, and I, I realized that you actually were a recipient. You actually got to go through the culinary program. You had first learned about kitchens for good at a really difficult time in your life. You were incarcerated. And, and then you had a series of events that happened to you that really, uh, my heart just reached out to you. Can you share your story with us? Well, um, there's a lot of story to tell and I don't, we don't have a lot of time, but basically five years ago, I was at one of the worst times of my life. It was pretty dark and pretty empty. I was homeless. I was living on the street. And I just knew I had to do something different. It just wasn't working. And I found Kitchens for Good and it helped me save my life. It really did. And even, you know, while I went through the program, I graduated and I knew that I always wanted to be continued to be with Kitchens for Good. And Luckily, I was hired um, in the catering. When they stopped doing catering, I was able to go back over to the back of the house, and one thing led to another, and here I am working with uh, Chef Ryan, who, might I add, is the best boss in the world, and it's just, it's amazing working with these people and the students, the apprentices, I'm able to interact with them because I save so much time because we're so organized now, and <laughs> The uh, process improvement has improved my ability to, you know, interact with the apprentices and help mentor them and be supportive to my coworkers and to my chef and to the instructors. And it is just such a pay it forward organization. It's that is so wonderful. Thank you for sharing. We're almost out of time with you, but I just had one last question. How many graduates or classes has Kitchens for Good had go through the culinary program so far? Right now we're on class 23 um, of our culinary program. And we also have a baking apprenticeship program and a food service manager apprenticeship program. Um, in total, I'm not sure exactly how many individuals have gone through, but we have had about 23 classes and each class is roughly 15 to 20 apprentices. Oh, that is so awesome and so wonderful. And you guys do a lot of fun stuff too, like, uh, you know, virtual dinners and things like that. So I'm going to have you guys hold on. Thank you so much, Ryan and Karen. We're going to hold, have you hold on for about 10 minutes. We're going to bring you back in for a wrap up and Q&A. And then I'm going to go ahead and introduce San Diego Humane Society. So thank you so much for sharing your story so far. Thank you so much, Trace. All right, now, next let's welcome members of the San Diego Humane Society, an open admission shelter, creating a more humane world by inspiring compassion and advancing the welfare of animals and people. Its life-saving safety net has helped San Diego become the largest city in the U.S. to keep healthy and treatable shelter animals from being euthanized. The San Diego Humane Society provides animal services for 14 cities within San Diego County. They have over 500 employees and care for 50,000 animals. They also share their learning and expertise and collaborate with other shelters, shelter organizations nationwide to help save more animal lives in their communities. And my dog is sitting right next to me because he is very excited to hear. And so today we are welcoming Tina Wynn, the VP of Employee Engagement, and Audrey Lang, Senior Vice President of Organizational Development. Welcome, Audrey and Tina. Thank, Thank you. you. We're happy to be here. 
Yes. Well, a lot of people, unlike Kitchens for Good, I bet you a lot of people know what San Diego Humane Society does. And they're probably wanting to give you a hug right now because of all the love you give animals. So thank you so much for agreeing to be one of our guests for the Process Palooza. I'm really excited to talk to you. And I'm sure there are lots of cat and dog lovers and animal lovers out there very excited as well. So tell us, first of all, you guys have been on a journey for a number of years now and you have something that you call culture of care that you're doing at the Humane Society. So tell us, what is that and why is this so important? Audrey, did you wanna share first or Tina? Sure, I'll, I'll share about that. Our, our culture of care is based on our, our core values across the organization of compassion and courage, impact, inclusion, and integrity. And so it means that for all of us who work together and the guests who come here and the volunteers, we treat each other with respect. We value diversity and inclusion. Uh, we, we focus on developing people and modeling leadership and really working to build uh, a, a more humane world by inspiring compassion. Oh, that's wonderful. And, what, what would you say, Tina? And Tracy, and one of the pillars of our culture of care includes um, improving continuously. So um, continuous improvement is built into our culture of care, which is really phenomenal. And that's why it's so important to us. I love that you, you have included that. So tell me, what is the connection between the culture of care and process improvement? Why did you feel it was important to bring those together? We rely on our donors to help support us, to keep us solvent. And so it's really important for us to be effective and efficient and uh, using our donor dollars wisely. And so it's really important for us to continue to innovate and be effective and efficient. Right, and, and we have two goals with our, with our process improvement initiative. Uh, one is to make things more efficient in the way people do their jobs. Uh, the second is really to make sure we are reducing stress uh, by being more efficient because works, working here at the Humane Society can be very stressful in terms of the numbers of animals and also the seriousness of the situations. It's truly life or death. And we are helping people and animals sometimes on the very worst day when they're having to say goodbye to their animals or um, face other challenges. And keeping our staff stress down also keeps the stress of animals in a shelter down. So you've done a lot of things to really and build that culture of care for your employees as well. I remember you talking a little bit about some of the things you did during COVID to, to really uh, support your employees. Did you wanna share a little bit about that? Well, there's a, there is a, a lot of things that we did during COVID. Um, you know, I think the first thing is when COVID hit us, um, the first message is don't worry about you know, there's a lot of anxiety that occurred during that time period, period and employees were scared to come to work, to come to work sick. And, um, you know, the message was take care of yourself and don't worry about your finances. We'll take care of you. We'll pay for your wages during this time period, but be where you need to be. And I think that just hearing that message initially was huge for employees to not worry about their paycheck, about a job. And that was one of the first fundamental components. And, and really our culture of care is, you know, respecting ourselves, employees and animals and making sure that they are well. Yeah, and, and we also were really nimble in terms of taking processes that are normally done face to face. Mm -hmm. People come to the shelter and browse the animals. Well, that wasn't possible during COVID. And we also really wanted to keep everyone working because we knew we would need them after COVID as well. And so we trans transitioned uh, very quickly many of our in-person processes to be virtual so that employees could work from home. Uh, they adapted the adoption process so that that could happen over the phone or over Zoom. Uh, in, and people could browse the animals online. Uh, we transitioned our call center to work from home and had to keep the numbers of people at the workplace down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 
I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, this has resulted in you guys being recognized as one of the top employers in San Diego. Congratulations. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, you know, I think uh, adapting to change uh, very quickly, but primarily taking care of the employees during a time of change was huge um, in, in that aspect. Um, you know, really taking care of employees first. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the most important thing is even though we're an animal shelter, we all love and care for animals, but people first, always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And since you've been on this journey, embarking, pardon the pun, embarking on this journey, what has happened with your employees and your employee engagement? We've really seen people step up and be willing to do whatever is needed to keep people and animals safe. Um, the award for top workplace is based on an employee survey. So it's really our employees who, who voted us a top workplace. And, and that's what's most important to us is how they feel. We want people to come and work here, stay a long time, uh, take advantage of opportunities to work in many different jobs and, and grow in leadership throughout their time. Mm -hmm. That is a wonderful, you know what? I might apply there. <laughs> Do you need process improvement, yeah. people? <laughs> Absolutely. So, so we my are question, with that mindset, Tracy. <laughs> so let me ask you, what kinds of projects have you have you done at the San Diego Humane Society to improve the care of animals or for finding pet owners? What, what, what would you what would be some examples? Because I know you've shared some really interesting applications. Sure. One of the applications was uh, developed in our uh, among the, the employee team in our kitten nursery. Our kitten nursery takes in anywhere from 800 to 1,000 kittens every year. Uh, the kitten season is very long here in San Diego where the weather is wonderful. And so our kitten nursery houses kittens ages zero to eight weeks old. And uh, because they're very delicate in their condition and may have been orphaned uh, due to something happening to the mother kitten, uh, which by the way, a, a mother kitten is called a queen. Uh, that's something new I learned when I was here. So uh, either queens and their kittens come in and our kitten nursery staff and volunteers care for them until they are old enough to be spayed or neutered and, uh, and adopted out. They socialize them, they care for them around the clock, uh, bottle feed them every two hours and monitor their weight uh, very closely. This is like a NICU in a human hospital. So, um, so one tool they developed with Excel was called Kitten Tracks uh, to very easily track kitten weights and reference them throughout the day with having, without having to go in and, and run a new report every couple of hours. Mm -hmm. um, so that literally was a life-saving process improvement tool that the staff developed. Uh, they also had lots of other ideas uh, when we did our two two-day Kaizen event. We're running process improvement with every department throughout the Humane Society and um, the staff have come up with some great ideas for improving the way they do laundry, store supplies so they're easily accessible, uh, the way they bathe kittens, making sure that there's a consistent protocol that it's written down and that training um, is done consistently. Wow. And so what is next for you? What are some things that are on the horizon in terms of your continuous improvement journey? Well, our next group to do it will be uh, the dog licensing department. And by the way, our licenses are free for the whole month of June. We're really doing a, a push to get everyone to license their pet mm -hmm. um, and, and to make sure that they can be found if, if they are lost. That's the best way to identify them and to also microchip. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Well, I want to thank you both for sharing a little bit about what you're doing at the San Diego Humane Society. It, it makes my heart and uh, be, I don't know, just warm and fuzzy all over 
Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and ask Ryan and Karen to come back from Kitchens for Good to discuss applying process improvement to nonprofits in general. And so I think what's interesting is people don't necessarily assume that nonprofits uh, would be doing process improvement. But what are why is it so important for you for you to be implementing process improvement within your your organization? Why don't we start with with Karen and, and Ryan? I think, think it'd be uh, so important. Tina Tina hit on it uh, briefly with uh, her conversation on on donors. I think um, because nonprofits operate on a, a slim budget every year, that it's really important for us to find those ways that we can really um, trim back some of the fat and, and focus on uh, what we, we need to succeed. Um, and, and a lot of that is just identifying if the process that we're working within is efficient and if we can find ways to make it more efficient. Um, in, in our in our way, the more efficient we become, the more people that we feed, um, just in the same way that the San Diego Humane Society, the more animals that they're able to help. So for us, um, it's it's really important to identify what processes we can improve on just based on one, the bottom line and people that we can help in the end. Mm -hmm. Yes. Audrey or Tina, anything to add? Sure. Um, nonprofits uh, can be around a long, long time. San Diego Humane Society is 140 years old. And so processes that were established 140 years ago probably aren't so good today. And it's important to stop. And, and we learned that from Lean Six Sigma. It's important to set aside time to just look at your processes so you don't keep on doing things uh, the old way. Mm -hmm. Is there anything special, I mean, about applying process improvement in a nonprofit environment. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of places I go, I mean, I've worked in military, education, uh, nonprofit, um, and people always say, well, we're different. Is there anything different about applying process improvement in a nonprofit environment? What do you guys think? I think it's even more important. Um, you know, one, we, we talked about the resources, but I think that when people work for nonprofit organizations, they um, want to find meaningful work. And so by contributing back and creating processes that, uh, you know, help with the bottom line or help with the customers, um, you can help with the mission. I think that th that means even more to them as an individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great for morale too. I mean, people feel very passionate about, about the work that they do here and, and um, having a voice in, in uh, making things better is, is a really important thing, I think, in the nonprofit world. Absolutely. Yes. So a funny story. So I, I actually started helping nonprofits with my process improvement experience because I volunteered once at my son's elementary school and his teacher told me that I, I really sucked at making copies. So <laughs> I thought, okay, well, maybe I should do something that I'm relatively good at instead. And so I decided to help some nonprofits and uh, the other piece that happened is I actually volunteered with my son at Feeding San Diego, and it was a wonderful volunteer experience. And, and so both of you guys have a big, a large base of volunteers. What, have you applied process improvement within, the, within the, the volunteer processes at all in terms of making it easier for people to uh, donate their time? I think for us, it's really important because we work in such a large volume that we have to implement the same thing every day. And when we have this process that we know what we're doing is so much easier to give the volunteers very clear and precise instruction on what they're doing. And then their volunteer experience is so much more fulfilling and rewarding to them. And then in return, it's more productive for us. So super important for us to implement that and it has helped us tremendously with our volunteer aspect of uh, Kitchens for Good. Wonderful. How about Audrey and Tina? What, what kinds of things have been applied for volunteers in the volunteer processes? If any. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. Um, you know, we try to apply some of the processes um, that we do for our employees for our volunteers so that they have the same 
experience or they have the same protocols um, and processes so that we're as efficient because we work hand in hand with our volunteers and they're so important to our mission. And so it's important for us to be able to utilize their skills effectively as well. So we use the you know tools that we use for ourselves, such as the visual management, um, you know, just you know, seeking um, feedback, asking questions when they give us feedback and asking the whys and continue to ask whys until we really get to the root cause. So very similar processes for our volunteers. Very nice. And throughout COVID when volunteers couldn't be on campus, uh, we held quarterly updates for them on Zoom, um, had a chance for questions and answers and ideas to come through. So there's a lot of open communication in that way. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I know a big question for some people out there is, well, how do I get involved? So I know that each of you, both, both organizations do have volunteer programs. So why don't we start with, with Ryan and Karen? Why don't you just share how, how volunteers, you're leveraging your volunteers. And I'd love to hear after that, Audrey and Tina. Sure. Um, the best way to find out about our volunteer opportunities is online. Um, you can check out kitchensforgood.org and we have a variety of uh, opportunities for volunteers to participate. Um, the most common one is packaging the meals um, because we do work in such large volume on a daily basis. Unlike the, the um, Humane Society, we have a pretty lean team. We work with about 20 people uh, full time. And additionally, we, we work with about 15 to 20 volunteers every day. So we almost have an equal staff and volunteer size. Um, and so there are opportunities to package meals. You can also help out. We have been experimenting with a used uh, kit or a pre-loved kitchen um, item pop-up that we've been doing. Um, and, and you can help price and uh, work the store. Um, there's many different opportunities um, to volunteer and help out at Kitchens for Good. So all of that information is available on our website. Do you need any food testers? <laughs> always, <laughs> always. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And Tina and Audrey, please share. How can someone get involved with San Diego Humane Society as a volunteer? Well, just as Brian said, our, our, the best way to get involved with us is to sign up online at sdhumane.org. Mm -hmm. And I really want to get over there and volunteer for Kitchens for Good. And I know a few recent retirees who are interested. So we'll <laughs> sign up to help you. Perfect. And we love to come over and pet some animals. Too. Absolutely. <laughs> so just another question for Kitchens for Good, uh, because I know that you guys had to make some significant changes after COVID. You basically ended your whole catering program. Is that mm -hmm. something that, and I don't know if you can answer to this, is that something you're going to revisit after COVID or is that something you're not going to do anymore? Or uh, what's, what's next for you, I guess, is a better question. I think we're, we're starting to innovate in other ways beyond catering. Um, we are doing some small operations, uh, more large format hunger relief rather than catering. So for different organizations, we would provide a whole tray of food versus individually packaged meals as buffets are becoming um, more of a possibility again. Mm -hmm. um, but it looks like we're not going to be returning to full catering operations, but instead doing retail food operations, gift boxing, um, direct to consumer mailing of our products, um, as well as this pre-loved um, kitchenware uh, pop-up that may become a full retail store in, in the neighborhood mm -hmm. sometime soon. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, we have a few minutes and we have a few questions. So one of the questions is for San Diego Humane Society. I'm not sure if you can answer this, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask it and you just say, you know, maybe where to look. Uh, this is from Kristen. We got our sister cats from the Humane Society. When you find animals in the wild, how do you determine who are litter mates and their ages? And I'll just add, and do you apply process improvement to that? <laughs> uh, one of the things that our, our kitten nursery staff uh, process improvement team actually came up with was a consistent way to uh, provide consistent information on the paperwork, the age, the, the color, the gender of, of the animal so that they're, so that everybody's talking about the same thing when they say it's a, a tortie 
cat, uh, you know, age age two weeks, um, there are there are online trainings that we offer on how to age an animal. Mm -hmm. Very nice, thank you. Okay, we do have one other question, um, and that question is from Justina. How to start and convince people in the NGOs to do process improvement? How do you find your problems? Who or what told you about this? Does anybody want to speak to that first? I'll let you time. I'll give you time to think. And here's what I'll say. I know that when I started helping kitchens for good, they had a couple of ideas on problems. But then I, I actually, that's why I followed Karen around because I wanted to know what her problems were and I helped them connect the dots into, okay, this is where I think I can help you in this process. And because sometimes people don't know, they don't understand process improvement enough to know, oh, this is a great problem for Six Sigma. So that was part of the connection I, I felt like I helped make, um, although they had a couple of ideas on what to do as well. So um, any other comments, Tina or Audrey or, or Ryan and Karen about convincing people or how to find problems? I would expand on what you were, you mentioned. I think one of the most valuable pieces of advice that you were able to give was you can't see the problems of the process if you're living within the process. So being able to remove yourself from that space to look as you did look at Karen's process from a distance, I think you challenged us to be able to back out of our own process on a daily basis and observe it so that way we could, we could identify all the problems that we were facing. And I think just because you're taught to do something a particular way, that does not by any means mean that it is the best way or the most efficient way to do it. So always voice your opinion. If you have an idea of maybe cutting some corners that are going to help improve the whole process, by all means, voice it, because if not, you need to be heard. Mm -hmm. You know, since our culture of care does have the continuous improvement component in it, when we have new hires, we ask them to challenge us on our processes. And so that helps shed, you know, some new fresh eyes and perspective into our processes to, um, to help us improve. And so that's something that we bring in and we, we seek on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. And so I think that may be a way that others can also try to create improvements and then it, it builds that relationship with the new hire with the organization and they're part of the changes that um, they make. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and part of our two day uh, Kaizen event is to teach uh, people how to go on a gamble walk mm -hmm. and in a non judgmental way, go and observe and take notes uh, when you're not doing the work and, and so we all engage in that. Um, and, a, and a goal is to really get more staff out to visit other campuses and other departments. We take in and rehabilitate wildlife as well. So we have a campus out in Ramona and one here in San Diego uh, with, with uh, injured birds and, and skunks and raccoons. Um, we even have some bobcats out in Ramona and, uh, and so, we are, and by the way, we are looking for volunteers to help with wildlife care. Um, and those opportunities are on our website. Oh, thank you so much, all of you, Ryan, Karen, Tina, and Audrey. Thank you so much for joining us and inspiring us with your kittens and your kitchens for good. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I love the stories that you have. I'm giving you a big e hug right now. Thank you so much for having us. All right. I can't believe this is our last process palooza, but we've got a little bit more time to share with you. And I'd like to bring the focus back to UC San Diego, the organization that created Process Palooza. And I'd like to introduce UC San Diego's Chief Information Officer, Dr. Vince Kellen, who has a personal passion for continuous improvement and Lean Six Sigma. In addition to serving as the campus CIO, Vince is a member of the Chancellor's Cabinet and the CFO Senior Management Team. Vince brings a rare combination of academic, business, and IT strategy experience to his role. Vince was inducted into the CIO Hall of Fame in 2019 and has been honored three times with the CIO Top 100 Award. 
And today he joins us to help wrap up the final session of the Process Palooza 2021. How are you doing today, Vince? I'm doing great. Well, thank you for joining us today. So tell us, how long have you been at UC San Diego as the campus CIO? And what was one of the first things you focused on when you arrived? Well, I've been here uh, just uh, five years now. In fact, uh, five years at the end of May. Uh, so, uh, and with, with COVID-19, it sort of feels like 52 years, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, actually, one of the very first things I focused on when I got here was um, wanting to bring continuous improvement to all of ITS. And and so uh, when I approached Mosgan, I said, Mosgan, I need to get all 400 of our staff through Lean Six Sigma training in a year. And she took it on as a great challenge. And, uh, and from there, everything sprang forth. Wonderful. Um, and... How many people do you have trained now? Uh, well, Moshkan has the better details here in the, in the, in the we probably put close to 5,000, 4,500, somewhere in that range people through Lean Six Sigma training here at UC San Diego. And certainly with that, my unit, we require it for all new employees coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. So we want to keep every employee at least yellow belt certified. And then we're focusing on our service owners so that they all get their green belts uh, mm -hmm. as well. So what was, why was it so important for you to bring continuous improvement into your world here at UC San Diego? Well, you know, IT is, um, we're, we're, we're kind of like performance athletes, right? Like, you know, we're in the stadium and if we drop the ball, everybody notices, right? So if one of our services goes down, everybody knows. <sighs> And that puts a ton of pressure uh, for performance on a unit. And, uh, and, and the antidote is you can either react quickly to when a failure occurs, or you can actually prevent failure. And prevention is far better than, than trying to fix after the fact. And that leads to continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what's interesting about IT too is people just expect it to work right all the time, right? You have to be perfect. And that is the expectation. So not only is when things go wrong or you drop the ball, everybody knows, but everybody's in pain too, right? Because the, the expectation is, hey, it should work all the time, right? Yeah, correct. And, more, and we're a team sport too. We're not an individual sport. So it's rare that a single individual ever is really fully responsible for anything. It's a, it's a whole team dynamics and the team dynamics plays out over a long period of time, not a short period of time. So things you do two or three years ago, set up the teamwork you have today and the performance and the quality of the service you have today. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amazing. And now you've got 4,500 people trained across the university, 526 yellow belts, 55 green belts, 11 black belts, and still more to go. But I've also heard yeah. you say that continuous improvement is a deeply personal journey. It's not just armies of problem solvers. So tell us a little bit about what you mean by that. Well, and our numbers are very impressive, no question. But, you know, the numbers really don't tell the full story. The full mm -hmm. story is how does it live and breathe inside the individual? And so, for example, it's very easy in continuous improvement, Lean Six Sigma, and other quality improvement paradigms to be focused outside yourself on something you're going to improve. It's very difficult to turn that inside yourself and say, I'm going to measure myself and improve myself. And I think at a certain point in the journey, you have to realize that all of the continuous improvement is deeply personal for all parties. And thus requires an individual to kind of believe in the measured self and the ability to improve yourself based upon that measurement and hold yourself accountable to that measurement. That's a pretty hard uh, set of tasks for a lot of folks. Uh, and certainly our, you know, uh, having spent a lot of time in the martial arts, 30 years, 30 plus years in the martial arts, teaching and training and competing. Uh, in the martial arts, it's all about perfection. We are just constantly honing away, trying to get close to the perfect technique never really quite getting there, but always trying to get closer and closer to it. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an art of continuous feedback and continuous improvement. Every class is a Kaizen. It must be. Every 10 minutes of a class is a Kaizen. 
Every 30 seconds of a class is a Kaizen. Every motion you do is an attempt to improve upon the one you did just before and just to keep doing it over and over again personally. And so that's sort of my background is, from a personal standpoint is having been steeped in uh, lots of martial arts for a long, long time uh, and how to improve and self-measure. Well, I think uh, you raise a really great point. I mean, I've been doing process improvement for 20 years, and I think sometimes the natural, uh, the natural thought process is, oh, well, I'm fine. My processes are fine. But those people over there, their processes need work, and they need work. Or I sometimes run into people saying, well, can we fix somebody else's process? Because that's really the issue. So I think what you're what you're honing in on is this sort of personal responsibility um, that, you know, there needs to be change at the individual level, not collectively out there, but really making right. a commitment personally. Is that what you mean? Yeah, it's per <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely personal. And I'm going to say it's even doubly harder than that. For example, I'll use a baseball metaphor. Uh, not only does the individual have to be committed to performance improvement, the individuals have to be committed to each other to help each other improve. Mm -hmm. So how many people have as part of their job responsibility? My job responsibility is to make my teammate better. Yeah. Now that's, that, that's a requirement I try to put certainly on my senior management team here. You, our job is to make each other better, not just ourselves better. And the example here is that there's a, a third baseman and a shortstop in a softball game. And the shortstop has a little trouble going to her right. If the third baseman knows it and the shortstop knows it, and they both agree when the ball comes in this direction, the third baseman will cover that ball they will cover more balls going between them than a team of, of, of superior players who, who can't agree on that. So you have to be aware of not only your own weaknesses, your team has to be self-aware of each other's weaknesses. You have to be supportive of yourself as you're improving your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And in the highest level of competitive sports, that's, that's especially team sports, that's a requirement of, of many of those games. In the uh, corporate or the uh, not-for-profit or university world, uh, we don't really talk about that much. Mm -hmm. But to get to the level of performance we need, we need that team commitment and that personal commitment and the sense of vulnerability that creates as you do that with your teammates. Mm -hmm. Yes, I really like that analogy. And I think you, you're also touching on Sometimes, sometimes doing it for others, doing change, changing for others is more powerful <laughs> than just changing for yourself, right? Your team, you're doing it for your team or you're doing it for others yeah. uh, for, the, for the greater good. I think that's really powerful. I know that in healthcare, um, they used to, they were trying to get um, people in healthcare to wash their hands and they used to have the slogan, you know, you, you won't get germs. And that didn't really work. It didn't work as well as a slogan that said, you're going to save other people's lives by washing your hands. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So tell me about the concept, having a pebble in your shoe, because that is something that you, um, that we, we've talked about in the past. And how does that pertain to having this sense of commitment? Yeah. And um, there's a great uh, Taoist uh, proverb in um, the Tao Te Ching, uh, a journey of a thousand miles begins underneath one's feet. What that means is it's you that's walking, right? It's you that's walking. And I view the urge to seek continuous improvement is like doing that journey with a pebble in your shoe. You're like, dang it, something's bugging me. I got to improve this, right? Now, if you remove the pebble from your shoe, you no longer have the urge to improve anymore. So my take on that is you want to have that journey with a pebble in your shoe at all times, meaning a metaphorical equivalent of that, of uh, something that's irritating you, that's causing you to want to improve even better. Uh, so that's why I say always have the pebble in your shoe. Never, never be satisfied. Mm -hmm. So... I, I don't know about all universities, but I do know, and I'm very familiar with the impressive results you see San Diego has achieved in continuous improvement, not just in training, but also in application. Some of the, some of the support things you guys are doing, like the lean bench and B-COP and those kinds of things. 
And um, so I know that having that pebble in your shoe is an important thing, but specifically for other institutions and organizations, what, what could be done to move the needle further along, like other, other higher education organizations? What would you uh, suggest that they do to have this, this goal of establishing a continuous improvement culture? Well, I think uh, looking at what's happened here, what I really love about what's happened here is it grew from the ground up, right? So it didn't necessarily grow from the top down. While I had a, a role to play in helping it get started, it really, really grew bottom up. And that's the way revolutions occur. It's usually one or two people who lead, and then the next two or three that join become very important. And the next two or three to join after that become very important. So mm -hmm. it's get the leader out, but then get the next follower in and then get the next follower in. Um, I like that what I call inside out adoption model versus outside in, meaning on top down or some outside entity coming in. We're going to put everybody through training. You're all going to do Lean Six Sigma. Thank you very much. And they leave. I'd much rather have an organic, genuine, inside-out adoption model that's driven by the will of the people, the passion of the people doing the work, uh, because ultimately it will not sustain unless those people have the passion for continuing it. Uh, and then in time, the culture and the practices will evolve and become uh, more stable, and then I think uh, the practice can be much more entrenched in the institution. So we're still early in our process here, despite the numbers we put up. Mm -hmm. We have a lot more work to do to get it really firmly entrenched in. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage start small, start inside, start with the passionate few, get the next group in, then the next group in, then the next group in. Don't put a hard time frame on it. Mm -hmm. It's an educational process. Let let the teams learn. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We have a question for you, Vince. Um, I've seen Lean Six Sigma programs collapse in university settings due to the program being located in the CFO or any silo, and the other silos didn't see it as their role. So how, how did you handle this in particular, or how did you see UC San Diego handle this silo issue? Well, as with, yeah, as with most questions, they contain an assumption, right? And I've been saying here, Lean Six Sigma is located in the individual, mm -hmm. not located in a function per se. It's located in the individual. Mm -hmm. And so it collapses when the individual leaves, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, get it into the individual. So it doesn't matter where it starts. It matters which individuals are getting excited about it. Mm -hmm. And so it can start in any direction. There's multiple right answers in the management uh, playbook here. There's not just one right answer. So it can start up in CFO. I would say virtually every Lean Six Sigma initiative that falls apart, it's because it was never really believed by much of anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the reason. Yeah. So you got to get people who really want to make a difference, who want to make a difference in their lives and their careers and their own little world. You want to enable them. You want to get them successful. Uh, and so the institution shouldn't be putting up barriers to there and should be putting up encouragements as part of it. Uh, so uh, now if it lives in, if it stops, if the, if the adoption model stops in the CFOS, of course it's going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to grow well beyond that. And, but I would say start with, start with with as many people as possible and grow it inside the individual. So what were some of the things that you can recall that did create that environment, that created that excitement and that passion? What was it that sort of started to get that locomotion going? Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to go back to a part of my history. I started this journey back in my Unical days, way back when. And I was one of the people in the back of the room looking at all y'all going, you're drinking the management Kool-Aid, you're all been brainwashed, you know, and I was like throwing popcorn at you from the back. And about a year and a half later, I was leading quality improvement initiatives in our unit. And so one, keep in mind that early naysayers are often late advocates because every person goes through their own thinking process as they start to do it. So don't be offended by the people in the back of the room who throw popcorn at you. Some of them will actually come around, and I have proof of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that's one. And the second one is, is you know, 
for each individual that gets excited, don't throw cold water on them, right? So if a supervisor is throwing cold water on an individual, intervene. So have somebody intervene with that supervisor. Just say, no, let them measure. Let the person measure in their own area, even though it might be upsetting to the team, and let them come forth with, with a Kaizen or some form of a, a measurement around this. And so don't throw cold water on the passions of people. Those are the first two most important things. You know, don't, don't mind the naysayers and don't throw cold water on anybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we're almost out of time. Probably just one last question. Um, and I really like to hear your thoughts on uh, something that you've talked about called the dance with perfection. Can you share a little bit about what that means? Yes, uh, for many of us who are younger in our career, earlier in our career, um, there's oftentimes a lot of looking sideways. Where am I ranking to my peers and everything? And how am I advancing relative to expectations of whoever's around me? In the martial arts Taekwondo, that disappeared. The only thing you're measured with against is tomorrow and perfection and yesterday and what you did yesterday. There is no other consideration, none whatsoever. There is no peer conformance. There is no what does X person say or X person say. So every day is a dance with perfection. And every day is a progress towards getting there, a personal progress. And so when I say dance for perfection, we're never going to get there, right? Everyone says, well, we're going to get our processes perfect, then we're done. No, you're never done. That's the whole point. The struggle is the journey. The failure to reach perfection is the beneficial outcome. It is the thing you should be desiring, not the perfection itself. And it's hard for people to begin to understand the joy is in the struggle. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. And people say, what? That seems so bad. No, it's not really bad. It's like we're all trying to seek that perfect whatever, perfect process Mm -hmm. of perfect whatever, just even if it's one time Mm -hmm. to say we did it. (laughs) Right? Um, and that's why I move with dance perfection. We should always be excited about that dance with perfection. Can we get there? Can we get there? Never giving up the belief that you can get there, even if it's impossible. Always having that belief that you can get there. Well, thank you for that, Vince. It's actually a, a very nice uh, analogy for being comfortable with imperfection. So I really want to thank you for joining us today and sharing your valuable insights with us. And thank you for all of your support uh, in UC San Diego's Lean Six Sigma journey. Thank you. All right. Up next, we want to welcome Tony Nava who works for UC San Diego's Operational Strategic Initiatives. Hey, Tony, how are you? Hello, Tracy, nice to see you again. Nice to see you again too. And he is also the coordinator of the Lean Six Sigma Scholarship. What is that? Tony, we hear UCSD staff members have a number of opportunities to delve in and learn about Lean Six Sigma. So are you gonna share what how people can get involved? No, no, I don't wanna do that today. No, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta razz you a little bit, Tracy. Uh, Yes, absolutely. So um, there was this question of silos and this question of growth and this question of adoption and building within the individual and working towards better and improvement. And uh, yes, we have the Yellow Belt program and it's it's prolific and it's open to all all staff and that sort of thing. Um, But then we see light bulbs sort of turning on. We see people get motivated. Um, So we're looking for opportunities to provide the next level of training. And UC San Diego Extension has a green belt and a black belt program. Tracy, you were actually my green belt instructor, so I, I thank you. Um, you know, you're a great instructor there. Um, so one opportunity I'm, I'm happy to announce uh, is anybody who is a UC San Diego uh, career staff member, if you attended any of the Palooza sessions, you are eligible for uh, one of two scholarships. So we're going to be providing two scholarships. The way we're going to navigate that is we're going to, we're going to pull the attendance sheets, we're going to filter out for all UC San Diego career staff, and we're going to email you uh, a little form so you can indicate your interest. Just fill out the little form, send it to us, and we'll select somebody by, we'll select two names from that list by the end of this week. That means you will get a green belt scholarship. You'll be able to go and work a project and complete the class for a green belt level without having to pay any cost whatsoever, which is super exciting. You can also apply those costs towards the black belt program if you wanted to do that, but you'd be responsible for the difference in the the program cost there. This is all leading up and sort of the kickoff for our open sort of application period for Greenbelt scholarships. So every year we offer additional scholarships, uh, approximately 20 each year uh, to, to, again, career staff. And this can be on the health side or the campus side. Um, so that process is going to be you, uh, you would submit your project idea and idea wave. 
uh, along with some additional information and a supervisor endorsement form. Uh, we have a committee of Lean Six Sigma experts who would go through and sort of score them. And then we select and announce and provide the same opportunity of scholarships for folks. There's gonna be an informational session on June 17th at noon. Uh, so there's information that we can provide on how to register for that and get more information about what the scholarship is, uh, what does it provide, how do you scope a project, all that good stuff. I do wanna say that having completed Yellow Belt is not a requirement for the Green Belt class or the Black Belt class, uh, but it can be a great start. So uh, again, OSI is offering uh, sort of periodic about once a month, we offer Green Belt classes that are open registration there. You can register for those via UC Learning. Um, and then, yeah, that's all pretty much I had. I just wanted to, again, share, uh, if you are UC San Diego staff and you attended any Palooza session, you'll be getting an email from me uh, with a, a form to fill out indicating that you are interested in uh, the one of two raffle scholarship spots. And starting on July 1st, we have the open application window for the larger scholarship session that'll run through August 12th. You'll see more information on our website, uh, as well as Blink, and we're trying to be prolific. We want to share that as far and wide as we can, because this is all part of the, um, as Vince mentioned, right, this is part of building the individual and sharpening our skills and looking for ways to improve and, um, and addressing that idea of, of siloship, right? Um, this isn't specific to one area of the institution or the campus. This is something that should spread far and wide. Uh, because, you know, once you once you can see and show the tangible benefits of Lean Six Sigma and some of the project work that comes out of this, other folks start turning their heads and they say, well, what are you doing? How did you do that? Like, how did you accomplish such a feat? And it seems like such a big accomplishment, but really what it is, is gaining a shared understanding of what your process is, what your steps are, and then applying the tools to evaluate and find improvement. So it's not about sprinting, right? I don't want anyone to think that, oh, we all have to now work harder, that sort of thing. It's about finding uh, a, a process that sort of just makes sense. And the tools uh, of Lean Six Sigma guide you towards getting there. So um, that's all I have, Tracy, back to you. Thank you, Tony. And you are an awesome instructor yourself. You pretty much hold your own because I've seen you in action. Thank you very much. I learned from the best. <laughs> it's always nice to hear about the many ways UC San Diego is embracing and supporting continuous improvement. I mean, a scholarship for employees, that is pretty cool. And I'm excited to uh, have those scholarship recipients in my classes. So before we move on, let's also share one more additional resource for UCSD staff members. You have heard about the campus business excellence, let me say that again, business excellence community of practice, BCOP. And we want to invite you to become a member. We will place a link in the chat box and you can sign up for the BCOP newsletter to learn about monthly learning events and a book club event that will be taking place this July. And everyone is invited to join BCOP's free event on August 5th as they host a summer book club. They'll be reading and reviewing Bill Balzer's text, Lean in Higher Education, increasing the value and performance of university processes if you recall, Bill joined the Process Palooza panel a few weeks back. So check out the, the chat, sign up for the BCOP newsletter. All right, guess what? We're ending on the results of the great Lean Six Sigma race. So when you see San Diego faculty and staff receive scholarships and take Lean Six Sigma classes, they work on amazing process improvement projects at the university. But there's another opportunity to revamp processes at the university, the great Lean Six Sigma race. This is when we take real campus business processes and allow teams to flex their Lean Six Sigma muscles to analyze and recommend improvements right there on the spot to the process owners. It has been traditionally a live, in-person, high energy experience where the spirit of competition really shines through. This year, teams completed it virtually using video conferencing and digital whiteboarding to come up with the best recommendations. So we've had six teams working on two separate campus processes. Three of our six teams worked on a process from the Opportunities Abroad program within the Study Abroad office. The Opportunities Abroad abroad program allows UC San Diego students the chance to earn transferable credits during the study abroad experience of their choice. 
So the Opportunities Abroad, abroad I don't know why I keep saying abroad, abroad program is one of many programs offered by the Study Abroad Group. The process is owned by Kelly O'Sullivan Summer and the Director of Study Abroad and Lisa Armstrong, the Global Seminars Coordinator. One of the primary benefits of the Lean Six Sigma race is that a real campus process is being improved and that implemented recommendations provide a direct benefit to the process participants, including staff and students. So the three teams who worked to understand and improve this process were the Black Eyed Leans by Patrick Bergeron, Brianna Lewis, Genti Laghi, and Ingrid Chamberlain. Orange is the new black belt with Peter Blondo, Catherine Kung, Lisa Trahan, and Libby Pelham. And the Aqua Analyzers, Michelle Corcoran, Sherry Park, Jamie Gonzalez, and Farah Rahman. So during the first week of Process Palooza, the competitors worked to improve this process with the goal of reducing cycle time in the Opportunities Abroad program application process. Working virtually, the teams collaborated via Zoom and Lucid Spark to identify and analyze the problem and recommend actionable improvements to our judges. So throughout the working session, the teams were able to ask questions of a team of Lean Six Sigma experts and the process owners. This support ensures that the team has an accurate understanding of the process and of DMAIC, which is the method for Six Sigma, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control tools. And they're judged on those. So after their five hour working sessions, the teams presented the results to our panel of judges. Our judges scored each team on their use of Lean Six Sigma DMAIC tools, their actionable improvement recommendations, the anticipated impact, and the result of the implemented changes, their creativity, and their presentation and teamwork. No pressure. <laughs> this year, our panel of judges are made up of Lean Six Sigma experts from across campus and UCSD Health, as well as the process owners. Our five judges are, Drum roll, please. Alora Perdinas, Managing Director, Office of Operational Strategic Initiatives. Lily Angelosi, Transformational Healthcare Lead Coach. Carlos Rojas, Director, Clinical Research Strategic Initiatives. Lisa Armstrong, Student Services Advisor, Global Education. And Haley Caraballo, Project Policy Analyst, Office of Undergraduate Education. So these teams were comp competing for a grand prize consisting of a virtual celebration with the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, Allison Sutterfund, Interim Facul Faculty Director of Global Education and Professor of Medicine, Dr. Chip Schooley, an Associate Vice Chancellor, Educational Innovation, Carlos Jensen, a feature and a feature on UC San Diego's IT service podcast, The Current. So they're gonna be on that podcast, which is awesome. And a Yellow Belt Scholarship for two of the team's colleagues. So before we find out who the winning team is, let's take a look at some of the highlights from this year's presentations to the judges from our amazing teams. We're gonna go ahead and play a video. So the problem statement is the Opportunities Abroad program is a great experience preceded by a lengthy, burdensome and confusing process for students. At the same time, the complex and convoluted process puts pressure on available staff time and university resources. The biggest bottleneck is the waiting time for admissions approval. There are only four trained staff to do this, and the average time frame for completing the application process through OAP is around six, but up to 10 weeks during the admissions peak application reviewing season in the spring. The second one is the applicants spend hours of time compiling course documents into one PDF. Another one is there isn't a guaranteed approval of credit transferability until after the transcript is received. Well, the official transcript. So a lot of times um, when applicants are actually submitting their course descriptions to in their applications, they aren't guaranteed to get all the classes that they're applying for. And the last one is there is a lack of integrated digital system 
to submit and approve applications. So a lot of things happen via email and there's a lot of waiting time in that. And some of our recommendations are to double the amount of trained admissions officers to be trained. So we're requesting or recommending that they add four more. Um, another recommendation is have an assigned admission counselor to each program. So one of the pain points for some of the admission count, um, counselors were it would take a lot of time because they weren't as familiar with some of the programs that they were reviewing. So if you had an assigned admission counselor for each program, that would reduce some of that time. The next one would, would actually be a big one, um, which would be to utilize and implement ServiceNow. So we are recommending that the application would actually be in ServiceNow where there will be a approval workflow to alert folks when things need to be approved or when something is waiting on them. And then the final one is to create a repository of approved courses for each program with the prerequisites. And this would eliminate um, the, them not having guaranteed classes or approved classes on the application. We are doing recommendations for the study abroad opportunities process. Based off of this timeline, we saw, uh, we created a value stream map. We saw that the total lead time took about 75 days. And then from here, we identified the biggest bottleneck in the process. Um, I'm going to pass it off now to Lisa, who's going to talk about the discoveries. What we found is that the majority of the time for reviewing these um, occurs within the admissions office, partly due to the fact that there are only four individuals who are trained to do this review process um, for international credits. We also learned from Kelly that the review process to verify the institutions and the courses itself seems very burdensome, but we learned that some departments keep lists of previously approved institutions and courses, but it's not a universal practice. It's a bit of a firm process in terms of the review of, by different departments happening sequentially, um, and that some exploration has occurred in terms of options for an electronic uh, routing system. And we also noticed that uh, based on the, the timeline for when the review needs to occur because of the length of time that it takes, the syllabi may not be available in time. Um, and Peter's going to go on to talk about our improvement recommendations and share a little bit more about that. So as was mentioned, uh, one constraint was there's only four individuals who could do this, and they are at the peak time of the work, definitely they have a much larger staff uh, in admissions. So one of the suggestions was, well, we could train additional people uh, and we can then reduce um, at least the cycle time, if not the total time. If you do have additional people, um, one of the things in this area is, well, we could certainly batch the process. So uh, we don't need to wait uh, for a long period of time to do it. And if everybody did it at the same time, let's if we had eight people or even if we had four people, uh, they could do it within a shorter period of time. Uh, and perhaps by doing that, they could actually help each other. So the other part is the uh, um, the training. So the question is, can can the training be different? Uh, can does it is it required? And that was not known. Um, uh, why the twelve hours specifically? So that's something we would have to know. It's our recommendation to say evaluate that and see if we could reduce that time and train additional people. Uh, number three is one of the things that's very important to help um, the timeline. Uh, people are keeping lists of uh, things they've verified and viewed before to save time. So if they could share that with students so they know what to expect, uh, certainly you could still give them a caveat that it's not foolproof and, and you still need to go through the process, uh, but sh share it with anybody, all the stakeholders, so they know, oh, it's already been reviewed. One is, does the approval need to be sequential? Uh, there's some time savings there with the uh, uh, perhaps the department and the college reviewing in parallel. Uh, with a conditional approval. The uh, electronic documentation, so one of it is to look at uh, DocuSign, and Kelly mentioned the uh, issues with DocuSign, to revisit the capabilities since it's been two years, um, but look at other options for electronic approval and making it easier to fill in and uh, fill in once. Finally, if you could achieve the uh, uh, um, implementation uh, recommendation for uh, item one, um, in a batch process, you could save time by moving the deadline up. The academic planning form APF is a lengthy, burdensome, and confusing process for students. The average time frame for completing the application process through OAP is around six to 10 weeks. 
The application submission deadline precedes the availability of the required syllabi. What we've discovered is that the time frame and deadline for the summer and fall, uh, um, fall study abroad program approvals interferes with the first year admissions application period. It is the busiest time of the year for um, admissions. We also found that only four out of the 24 officers um, are trained, um, trained to do approvals for the OAP um, applications, but it only takes 12 hours to complete training uh, each individual trained, um, and it takes seven weeks of wait time for admissions review, but the process only takes 15 to um, three hour, 15 minutes to three hours. So some of our improvement recommendations are cross-training admissions officers periodically um, with training time paid by OAP, and then um, create awareness and education around OAP with all functions involved, focusing on the increased engagement and faster graduation um, rates for the underrepresented populations um, as the ultimate greater goal. Another recommendation was the um, e-signature software like um, Kuali platform could increase overall efficiency, reminders, and alerts involving multiple parties and legal compliance. All right, as Michelle identified, uh, we really looked at the process time and the wait time. Process time is really uh, stays the same, uh, whether we, we have four staff working on it or eight or 12 or 24. So we really focused on the wait time here and we were able to uh, reduce the lead time from 11 weeks to seven weeks with eight officers trained and then really five and a uh, 5.1 week with 24 officers trained. And you know this can be done periodically. The training based on the availability, we can use different uh, quarters, and maybe the the spring quarter that is a less impacted quarter, we can use the training opportunity during the times when the staff is less busy. And uh, for the for the control plan, which as we all know, we can make the improvements, but if we do not have the sustainment piece to it we pretty much have not done anything really. So what uh, the control plan we, we identified is that, you know, leadership escalation for OAP and admission office, if education and training uh, is not completed as planned, um, you know, as I, as I uh, just shared that, that training can be done on um, the less imp impacted quarters also, we we looked at the perhaps a metric which uh, we identified as the improving the graduation rate for our underrepresented student population, which is eighty percent of it that are applying to this OAP program. That if we can use it as a metric to keep an eye on the process, if it's working optimally or not, and uh, having a standard oper operating procedure, so we can have. Uh, make sure that it's working and perhaps creating an audit schedule to monitor the progress of our um, the SOP. And that is the that is the way where leadership is involved and we're keeping an eye on the process periodically, making sure that everything is working as planned. So we have tried to create a sustainment plan that's that's doable along with the uh, with with our process here. And I really appreciate all the team and working with them. It was really a lot of fun. Well, that is awesome. Love those presentations. And look at that. Kowali Bill was mentioned as one of the team's recommendations, our sponsor. So that was a lot of fun viewing those presentations. Really nice work on all the teams. The full presentations, if you are interested, will soon be available on the Process Palooza website. So clearly the judges had their work cut out for them. But after a tough deliberation, the judges finally came to a decision, which we are revealing for the first time today live. So I know that there's some, probably some nail biting going on here. Are you guys ready to hear the winner? The winner of the great Lean Six Sigma race for the Summer Graduate Teaching Scholars Program is the Black Eyed Leans. Woo woo! Congratulations and really nice work. But guess what? 
We aren't quite done with the announcing of the com competition winners. We also have the best in team award voted upon by members of each team. So the best in team award winner from each team will win a seat at the Walk Me Builder certification course valued at $4.99. WalkMe is a code-free digital adoption platform that helps users easily navigate business systems. The best in team award winners from the Summer Graduate Teaching Scholars Program are Brianna Lewis from the Black Eyed Leans. Lisa Trahan from Orange is the new Black Belt. And Michelle Corcoran from the Aqua analyzers. Nice work. Congratulations. You guys are awesome team workers and collaborators. Okay. And I'm sorry, I meant to say opportunities of broad program. <laughs> okay. So congratulations to the competition winners. We hope to see all of you at next year's Process Palooza. But in the meantime, we would love to stay in touch. Everyone who's attending one of our eight sessions is automatically on our mailing list. And you'll be hearing from us with news and updates. Coming first, we'll have a podcast interview later this month with the winning teams from the Great Lean Six Sigma Race. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Okay, we have learned so much together over the past weeks. We have discussed the future of higher education post pandemic and the role of continuous improvement. We've learned about how process improvement in healthcare has improved patient care. And today we learned about how process improvement can help us serve our community in a more efficient, effective and an impactful way. But that isn't all you are leaving with before you go, we have one more raffle. All right, so get ready. We'll have one lucky winner of a $500 voucher towards a project management or Lean Six Sigma professional development course, courtesy of UC San Diego Extension. And you win an electronic copy of the book, The Problem Solvers Toolkit, a surprisingly simple guide to your Lean Six Sigma journey authored by Elizabeth Swan and Tracy O'Rourke. Yes, that's me. So now for the instructions for the raffle. I will give you a question to answer. The chat function will open for answers to be typed in. You'll have one minute to type the answer in the chat window. When the time is up, the chat window will close and a winner of the prize will be randomly chosen from all of those who have correctly answered the question. Okay, are you ready? Get ready. Okay, here is the question. The San Diego Humane Society is creating a culture of blank. So now's your time to tell us what kind of culture is created at the San Diego Humane Society. And while we're waiting for the winner to be determined, I wanna go over a few last minute announcements. First of all, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Kuali Build. No code platform Kuali Build is empowering individuals across UC San Diego's campus to reduce process waste and free up staff time to concentrate on more important activities. Learn more by clicking in the link in the chat. Okay, we also encourage you to please, please, please complete the post-event survey that you'll be sent shortly to help us continue to improve our events. Also, if you want to share or review what you learned today, we'll be posting a recording of this presentation on the website that we will be entering in the chat window. All right, and now it's time to find out the winner of the raffle prize. Okay, so what is the answer? The San Diego Humane Society is creating a culture of care. Yes, that is really what they're trying to achieve. And who is the winner of the raffle? The winner is Kathleen Van Dusen, woohoo! Awesome job, Kathleen, congratulations. And guess what? I am so sad and sorry to say that that brings us to the end of our final Process Palooza. Thanks to everyone who participated in this year's event, from the presenters to the panelists, our keynote speakers and our sponsors, and of course, Thank you all for attending and giving us your time today. Thank you. We'll see you next year.